Uh, thanks, Nara, and thanks, uh, Rob, for joining me, and thanks, everybody, for having me on to talk about this really exciting uh, integration that we've developed with uh, Dynatrace. Um, so today, we're just, we're just going to be talking about, um, um, you know, JFrog. Uh, we're going to talk about Dynatrace for a bit, and then we're going to talk about uh, what the motivations are for this integration and talk a little bit about what, how the integration is structured and then go into a demo. So let me just start, start off by uh, talking about JFrog as a platform and the genesis of JFrog and so you know what the motivations were behind JFrog. So uh, software development itself has actually uh, you know, evolved uh, leaps and bounds from what it used to be before. It used to be the case that you know, developers would use a very limited set of technologies and languages to develop code with. Um, and you would see organizations generally, uh, you know, updating or re releasing software very infrequently. Uh, you would hear about uh, teams uh, releasing software, you know, every quarter or maybe, you know, just twice a year. Now, fast forward to, to today, uh, where developers are using a, a wide uh, variety of uh, technologies and, 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 and languages and packages to develop their software. Uh, there's a heavy emphasis on using open source software for your software development uh, processes. Uh, in fact, about 75 to 80% of software is now open source software. And teams are having to release, uh, you know, multiple times a quarter, perhaps multiple times a day, uh, to keep at pace with uh, the competition out there. So, and add to that, you know, the 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 containerization or the modularization of applications that make it even more difficult to kind of manage this entire chaotic uh, sequence of software development. That's where JFrog essentially comes in. Uh, it provides support for, for a very large set of um, uh, technologies and languages and packages to unblock developers to use the, you know, the technology or the package or the, or the language that they, that they deem fit for the application. It involves, uh, includes a bunch of standardized uh, processes, with processes with respect to uh, metadata collection, policy, policy-driven mechanisms, methods, and secrets, and includes uh, a, a bunch of uh, functional capabilities from, you know, artifact management to security to automation of CI/CD pipelines to distributing distributing software, all delivered in one unified, universal end-to-end -end DevOps solution with which um, organizations can um, you know, quickly, efficiently, reliably, securely release software, build and release software um, uh, to their partners and to their customers. So if we double clicked on this and looked under the hood of, the, of what constitutes the JFrog platform, you'll see a bunch of different elements here uh, indicated in the green boxes. So everything that exists to the right side of your code repository where your, where your raw source code lives and uh, you know, version control systems like um, Bitbucket or GitHub, everything, the, the platform includes everything that allows you to build, test, release, and deploy uh, software at scale. Um, you know, as a developer, you're basically using, you know, your open source software, you're using, you know, uh, your software in a, in a version control system like GitHub or Bitbucket and declare dependencies and so on. You need a system where, you know, you can resolve those dependencies, trigger uh, build pipelines and compose that raw source code into artifacts, into binaries and so on. So that's where Artifactory comes in. It's a universal binary repository manager and sits right at the heart of our platform. Um, you can store your, so that Artifactory basically stores your, uh, your, you know, your packages, your binaries, your, uh, you know, Kubernetes container images, your dependencies. Um, and the idea here is to make sure that your software development uh, organizations have access to their, uh, you know, all their dependencies, all their components that they need to to develop their software reliably at scale uh, and, and with security involved in it. So Artifactory has uh, robust integrations with pretty much all the CI uh, and CD tool sets out there, whether it be uh, Jenkins or Circle CI or, or, or other tools out there. Um, it's 
It supports a, a wide uh, uh, array of uh, languages and technologies, as I already described before, from Docker to NPM to Nugget to Maven, Go, Cradle, you name it. It, it kind of supports all of that. And then it's got a system of access and authorization control. Uh, it's got uh, smart caching of um, storage and caching of, uh, of, of software artifacts such that um, you know, any dependencies, any components that you need are delivered reliably and efficiently uh, uh, to compose your software. Tied to this is uh, JFrog Pipelines, which is the native, um, which is our native CI/CD automation and orchestration tool with which you can construct um, and, and trigger a variety of different pipelines that are needed to basically build, test, uh, and deploy your software uh, across the entire DevOps lifecycle. X-Ray um, is our software composition analysis tool uh, that basically is basically you know uh, security embedded within the entire DevOps lifecycle. It recursively scans. Uh, you know, your software as it progresses uh, from the build, um, uh, testing and release and deploy phases, it recursively scans all your artifacts, all your images, all your builds across this entire life cycle to make sure that any software that you're developing and releasing to your customers is, is secure. Um, all any and all license violations are, are pointed out, any and all security vulnerabilities are indicated along with fixes, uh, such that anything that you release out there to your customers and to your partners is, uh, is, is cleared of any compliance and security vulnerabilities. Now, once you've done all of that, you need a mechanism to distribute software uh, to your clients, and so that means, you know, basically making software physically or artifacts or images physically available to a variety of different edges. So this could be, uh, you know, your on-prem or edges in the multi-cloud environment. That's where JFrog distributions come into play. And mission control and insights that sits on top of all of this provides end-to-end -end visibility throughout the entire process. So in a nutshell, it includes all the different elements and pieces with which you can take software from code uh, to production, uh, you know, efficiently, securely, and reliably uh, using a system of uh, methods and tools that are captured within this entire uh, platform. Now, you can consume this platform as an on-prem uh, on -prem tool, or you can actually use it as a completely uh, SaaS service delivered from the cloud. Uh, we have 24-7 support associated with all of this. And all of this essentially is built to scale uh, to make sure that, you know, you can, again, uh, release your software in a reliable fashion. Just as a, uh, you know, as a, as a few tidbits about JFrog itself, we've got about 6,000 uh, uh, customers uh, using our platform, uh, about, about 65 to 70% of which are Fortune 100 companies that are releasing, that are using uh, JFrog platform to manage their software release lifecycle um, across uh, multiple teams. With that, I'll uh, hand it over to Rob to talk about Dynatrace. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. That was a great overview. Um, so my name is Rob Jand. Um, I've been working with Ali on getting this demo together with you guys. I'm in the uh, alliances group. Where I work with great partners like JFrog to kind of show how we're better together and show, you know, through real examples. So today we're going to do a, a pr pretty deep dive and go show you a lot about how these pipelines work. But just as, as far as Dynatrace goes, if you've, you know us in the industry, we're now a publicly traded company. We have over 3,000 employees. We really are working with a lot of the world's leading enterprises out there, uh, recognized as a market leader um, within the observability space. Um, and what we really want to showcase today is talking about how we're going to, you know, integrate in that software delivery. So with with the platform of JFrog delivering the software and helping you manage that, um, the big part of it now is the observability piece. So maybe uh, Ali, I'll jump to the next slide and just talk a little bit about the Dynatrace platform. So Dynatrace um, is, I guess the big thing I want to get across is we're, we're a platform. So we, the origins of Dynatrace were in the application performance monitoring space. So knowing how to, uh, to monitor applications and user behavior 
was, was core of our product. But as you can see here with some of these other capabilities, um, it, it goes into what Ali said. So applications are being rolled out to on-premise infrastructure still, but also to the cloud. So having you know integrations that work on an agent-based technology, Dynatrace has something called the one agent. So it's really discovered at the host level, at the operating system level, and automatically discovers processes and applications uh, in that full stack, which I'll, I'll show you guys, as well as like bringing in data from you know, natively from, from a variety of sources, whether that's cloud metrics, whether that's API uh, data coming from Kubernetes, all that kind of ties in together. And we build a topology model dynamically for your environment, which we call the SmartScape. And then also all this feeds into the heart of Dynatrace, which is our AI engine. So understanding all these components as they come up and down, it's a very complex environment as, as Ali just described, all different types of technologies. So you really need an observability platform that can monitor each of those technologies, whether it's Java or Go, or microservices, a serverless component, Lambda, OpenTel, and really kind of stitch that together so you have an end-to-end -end view from the end user, even all the way to the back, the mainframe. So Dynatrace, if you didn't know it, also does mainframe. So we can go from you know end user, mobile, services, cloud, end to end, and that's really the value. And we're gonna see a lot of the metrics that are captured along the way. And then we're gonna inform, you know, the the software delivery process of what's happening in the environment. So really excited to kind of, you know, we'll jump right into a demo in, in a shortly, um, but then you can see the, data, the plat, both, both of our platforms in action. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Rob. So, so what brings us together essentially is the question here. So when we talk about, uh, you know, DevOps, current state of DevOps, right? It's kind of, um, you know, it operates in silos, right? So developers have their own perspective about releasing software, release manager, DevOps managers have their own perspectives. QA and testing teams have their own pipelines to deal with, uh, provisioning and operation teams have their own set of issues to deal with with, uh, with respect to application monitoring as, as Rob was mentioning, application traceability and so on. So a lot of the times, you know, we see developers kind of and operation teams. So developers essentially saying, you know, uh, what can I do to better understand the impact of code changes or commits uh, on the actual application, on the actual end user elements of the application? You know, they lack visibility and traceability around that. When you're talking to the IT operations team, the people who are tasked with the uptime of the application of the service and performance monitoring of the application of the service, SREs, IT admins, operation managers, they're usually complaining about the fact that, you know, once they do detect a problem in the runtime environment uh, across a specific application or a service, it's very difficult for them to trace it back to a specific uh, code commit, to a specific service update, to a specific developer who's committed that specific code, you know, to achieve that end-to-end -end traceability from the runtime environment all the way back to the code elements. Uh, and generally, it's kind of disjointed, right? So the information flow between the two groups is not really automatic. It's not really fluid. Um, there isn't a unified framework with which both teams can manage uh, the development and release of software. And both teams uh, are aching for, for greater levels of automation with respect to, uh, you know, removing some of the manual processes that exist in the current state of uh, DevOps practices. So with all of that, we thought about combining, you know, the event-driven event automation orchestration uh, event-driven uh, automated CI/CD pipelining capabilities of JFrog pipelines with the advanced, really advanced monitoring and troubleshooting capabilities that Dynatrace brings with its full, with its full stack, uh, uh, you know, uh, monitoring capabilities, including its AI engine to kind of stitch these two elements together to provide a more unified framework with which both of these teams can get aligned uh, greater automation then becomes possible, uh, and both these teams can basically align towards a unified way of managing software from code to production and monitoring issues uh, in the runtime environment, tracing issues back from the runtime environment to the code base and, and things like that. Um, with that, I'll hand it over back to Rob, uh, who's going to talk about cloud automation with uh, Dynatrace. Right. So that's exactly that's exactly right. I mean, when you think about DevOps, um, 
I mean, this is not new, <laughs> but you know, we, we are continuing to try to break down these, these barriers between the two teams. So w one of it is right. Having this, this common framework and, you know, from a, from Dynatrace, we're hoping to bring that, that common, you know, observability set of tools to both developers, SRE operations folks, so that everyone's seeing the same, same component. So no longer, you know, so the idea of, I have to go to team X, to look at the database and team Y to look at the end user behavior, which is why it takes a long time to troubleshoot problems and, and things like that. So what we're trying to do with, with Dynatrace is this area of, of shifting right, which is what we, we, we think about putting configuration in place as the software is being released so that it's just like configuration as code, infrastructure as code, we wanna do monitoring as code. So putting in the alerting rules, dashboards, um, auto tagging rules, et cetera, in as you're delivering your, your software, and that's something we're gonna see, allows us to then feed like a platform like Dynatrace with the information it needs to then be aware of what applications are running where, which we call our, our, our release, at least release inventory capability to see what's happening where, making decisions, understanding the <clears throat> risk of promoting something, um, and then also informing as we're doing our pipelines, um, which is kind of the shifting left, shifting left or right, I always get a bit backwards, but we're also letting, letting as we're deploying code that we say, hey, this event of a deployment or a configuration change, it could be like a feature flag, it could be a new version of code, could be whatever, a, a performance test is running, things that are happening in the environment with all the metadata of who, who is doing it, where did it come from, what, what components are infected, and, that, and that's really where all these tags come in. So really having a, a tagging strategy that could be dynamic, and that's kind of what we're gonna see. That's where automating automatic rules, automatic ability to detect applications, changes and things is really what Dynatrace is bringing so that you could pinpoint, you know, w you know I, whether there's a problem and I need to roll it back quickly, um, or this is everything's looking good, I can automatically uh, promote this out, say like a canary release, um, then roll it out to everybody, for example. So all these kind of service level evaluations, both from a production, and actually maybe these are good segues to the next slide. So as I drill in just a little bit more, so what Dynatrace um, has ability is to automatically detect um, versions that are being deployed in your environments, whether that's through Kubernetes labels, which is in the case uh, that I'm showing, or it, as you're deploying out your, your packages through environment variables, we, we want to let Dynatrace know the, the version, the stage, the environment that it's in, and then associate all these events that are happening taking place so that you can do this type of analysis, um, you know, right, right in product. Um, if you wanna hit the next page. So then the service level objectives, um, if I hit the next, oh, there you go, thank you. So service level objectives, you could think of kind of twofold. So as, a, as an observability platform, you know, this is, you know, the bread and butter of, of, of the ops teams, right? They're wanting want to make sure availability is up, but be able to get granular, not just, you know, it could be a service, it can be a component, it could be a service level around a business objective is my, are my conversions going properly as the volume of my, of, of my orders, you know, at a certain, maintaining a certain level. Um, so service levels can be tied to any metric that you want. So Dynatrace has tons of metrics. You could put lots of business metrics uh, in there as well and, and, and have them show up on customized views like this. Um, and maybe hit one more page. I think I've got one more here. Um, oh, maybe not. Okay. So these capabilities, we're going to dive into the demo and I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more, but I'll turn it over to Ali just so we can get yeah, to the, thanks, the demo Ron. part. Yep. No thanks. Problem. I'm sorry about the... Oh, no, no. Yeah. We want to get to the demo. Yeah. sure everyone's yeah. waiting to see that. So, so uh, yeah, before we went into the demo, because the demo and the integration is actually really heavily dependent on how pipelines operate. So I just wanted to take a, take a step back and explain what pipelines is. So uh, JFrog pipelines it is, an, it is a natively available uh, event-driven workflow automation engine uh, that is embedded within JFrog uh, as a product. So it benefits from all the recursive scanning capabilities of X-Ray, all the robust uh, built-in integrations with Artifactory with which it can uh, take dependencies and kind of trigger uh, your CI uh, pipelines. So, uh, you know, it automates your CI, uh, automates your CD, and automates your IT um, uh, provisioning management kind of uh, pipelines as well. So if you wanted to trigger a build um, and resolve dependencies and trigger a build uh, from Artifactory, you could do that with pipelines. If you wanted to then trigger trigger a CD pipeline with which you now have a releasable item that you need to deploy to a specific um, or, you know a production related repo, you could do that as well. If you wanted to trigger a pipeline with uh, you know uh, for, for IT uh, IT ops related uh, cases where you need to. Um, basically provision some resources for your testing and automation 
uh, for your integration testing, for your unit testing, for, uh, you know, across the various life cycles uh, of the software development, right? So whether it goes from a, a development to staging to a production environment, all across these different stages, you have to set up infrastructure to support the running of pipelines. Uh, all that can be done using integrations that it already has with uh, you know, uh, configuration management tools like uh, like Ansible, Terraform, Chef, Puppet, and so on. So that's essentially what the tool is. It's universal uh, in the sense that it um, supports, um, you know, all the three different uh, cloud vendors. You can actually run pipelines on any cloud vendor uh, itself. So it's vendor agnostic in that sense. You can also run pipelines on-prem, on, on dedicated VMs. Uh, um, and it supports any and all operating systems. Um, it uses a system called pipeline as a code and utilizes YAML file definitions with which you can define and construct uh, pretty complicated uh, pipelines uh, through code. Um, and it uses uh, a bunch of you know, uh, native steps uh, to allow you to do that in a low code kind of fashion, which I'll talk about later. Um, it also supports a series of integrations that, I, as I mentioned earlier on in my talk around uh, both CI server tools, CD tools, as well as uh, you know, infrastructure management tools as I, as I already described, and has built in secret management with which you can store secrets for specific integrations once, uh, so, you, so that you don't have to manage those secrets every single time you run a job. Uh, and you can reference those secrets uh, you know, with your third-party integrations, such as you know, your ITSM tool sets or, or you know, your CI CD tools uh, that you use. Uh, the one thing that I really wanted to mention here is uh, the cross-team collaboration aspects of pipeline. So when you talk about the DevOps lifecycle, uh, as I stated before, there's various different teams that are associated with the entire lifecycle from the start to finish. Uh, you know, you may be uh, composing a, a build a pipeline, but then you have to rely on another team to actually set up the testing pipeline, the testing configurations, the test or provision, uh, a bunch of resources for your test and integration testing, for your QA testing. Then you propagate that, uh, you know, build, for example, from a developer, uh, from a dev stage to a, um, uh, you know, a staging stage or, or, or a canary stage before you uh, take it into production stage. So across these different stages, you have different teams kind of having to manage their own independent pipelines uh, associated with testing, configuration, provisioning, and so on. Pipelines has a mechanism whereby you can construct pipeline of pipelines. So all these um, disparate pipelines that are interdependent can be brought together in a complete pipeline of pipelines such that, you know, they're all these inter interdependent pipelines can be interconnected together and run at the same time. Um, and so it promotes cross team collaboration. It promotes uh, the, um, uh, you know, the exchange of information between different uh, teams associated with the release life cycle of a software from again, from code all the way to testing, building, testing, deploying, and production uh, deployment. Um, so the pipelines and Dynatrace, uh, this, uh, we've actually put a sim sample pipeline uh, in a YAML file uh, for you. It's, a, it's, it's actually in a public uh, repository that I've listed here, um, the URL is right here. And I would just like to go through some elements of what pipeline entails, right? So pipeline is constructed through a, a series of steps. Steps are nothing but a unit of, of execution, right? So that requires these independent steps require a bunch of input resources. Input resources could be, you know, your, your dependencies, your files, um, or, or your, your, your bills, your images, or it could be the output of a step that has taken place before is before a particular step. I mentioned before the concept around uh, uh, different types of steps. So pipeline uses generic steps that are basically shell scripts or bash scripts that you can write on your own. But it also has something called native steps. 
uh, Native Steps actually encapsulate a series of actions uh, in a, a predefined step that you can actually uh, use without having to do any coding, without having to do any, any scripting. So in this case, for example, a Docker push with, this is a step that we're gonna be using to push a, a, a Docker image that we would be building um, using our um, a Docker file in, in a GitHub repo in the previous step. So we use these native steps to actually push a Docker build into Artifactory using a built-in built -in Artifactory integration that is indicated with the arrow there. That also, again, you know, highlights the fact that it, it already hosts a bunch, bunch of built-in integrations that can be utilized um, um, to conduct or to construct these pipelines and to run these pipelines in a, in a very efficient manner. Um, so we've constructed the sample pipeline that has a bunch of input resources and a series of steps that you can utilize to configure or to construct the entire pipeline with which you can, um, with which you can um, basically um, create um, an, uh, an, an image for the application, uh, publish uh, that image to Artifactory, create or publish a Helm chart to, uh, to Artifactory, deploy that Helm chart, uh, and then subsequently once, um, uh, you know, once the Helm chart is deployed to a Kubernetes cluster and the Dynatrace uh, monitoring is configured on that cluster, you can start to pick up deployment events and associate them with the application or the service that is being um, uh, deployed into the cluster such that you can then trace performance anomalies associated with, the, with that application or service all the way back down to a specific build or a commit. So in this pipeline, what Rob has actually done is taken the sample pipeline that we've developed and tweaked it to his own use case. In the first, again, the first four steps here, steps A, B, C, and D, these are built in native uh, integrations and steps uh, within the JFrog pipeline platform with which he's building a, um, an application image and publishing that application image or Docker image uh, to Artifactory. In step C, um, uh, he's creating a Helm chart and publishing it to Artif Artifactory. In step D, he's going to use a native uh, step to, to deploy the Helm chart into the Kubernetes cluster. Steps E, F, G, and H are essentially generic steps that utilize a bash script. So step E utilizes a bash script and calls a curl command to check whether the app is up. Step F modifies uh, uh, the Helm chart properties or basically enriches uh, the Helm chart with certain environment variables uh, that we get from uh, the, the Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster. Uh, again, this is also using a bash uh, script. Uh, step G uh, again utilizes a bash script uh, that runs uh, um, Dynatrace Monaco monitoring as code with which you can then instrument that cluster and start to pick up deployment events from uh, that cluster and, and a variety of different performance attributes. And step H uh, again uses a bash uh, script uh, and sends uh, the, uh, the deployment event from the JFrog pipeline uh, by calling a Dynatrace API into the Dynatrace engine with which you can then begin to associate these deployment events to uh, you know, applications of services that you are monitoring within the Dynatrace engine. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rob, uh, who's gonna go over the Monaco piece of it and eventually the... Um, yep, the so demo. yeah, no problem, yeah. So that's a great, so that, that demo, I'm gonna walk through each step in detail so that you can understand what's happening. I put a couple of links for those that are on the webinar. So Ali was mentioning Helm quite a bit. So if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, um, so Kubernetes, one of the ways that you can deploy applications is through a, a, a package manager called Helm. So you can go to helm.sh and kind of just read up on that if you're not familiar with it. And that's what Ali, Ali said. So it, it makes it really easy to, to use Helm with these native steps um, in the pipeline. 
Um, and so what, I, what I'm showing here is, is this use case that we've been, we've been talking about as monitoring as code, so or Monaco for short. So in the, um, if, you've, if you've read the state of, of DevOps report, um, one, of the, one of the recommendations they have is that organizations provide self-service to their dev teams and want to, monitor, want to automate the monitoring and alerting and capabilities um, as that facet of observability. So what Dynatrace has under the, uh, is, an, is a full rich API to manage the configuration of Dynatrace. So you could say add a dashboard, add an alerting rule all through an API. But then to integrate that into a pipeline, which you're going to see is uh, we built a, a, an open source. We talk about a lot of open source today, an open source utility called Monaco, where you buy that parses a predefined set of directories with YAML and JSON config that represent the config you want to push into Dynatrace. And then by invoking that through the JFrog pipeline, we can now, as part of the delivery of software, are pushing in the appropriate configuration that goes with our, our service. And we're going to see that today. So then, um, so this is where, you know, this use case is, hey, I, wanted, I want a new dashboard. I want some new service level. Um, no problem. Let's just add it to our code repo, run our code repo. Boom, it's done. So you have the full auditability of everything that was done. No one manually editing anything. And then by wrapping it with the self-service model, like a, like a, like a PR um, with an approval, um, now that can be all automated. So that's something we, we want to we want to sort of one of the things we want to highlight. So um, I think I'm just going to jump right into the demo. I think that's kind of our next section. Sure. Segue. Let me let me stop sharing and then hand yep. it over to you, Rob. Um, awesome. There you go. Okay. So I know there's a lot to see. So I'm going to um, kind of cover this. So what one of the things that we built today. Um, and I put the link, and then Ali showed that in the PowerPoint deck. Is all the all the example code, including the sample app, are all in a in a repo. So what we're going to see today is just this a very simple um, node-based application that kind of spins up as a Docker in a Dockerized image, and then and built into it, there are some different features that we can enable as we build and deploy the software. So our the code repo is is out here. Um, on GitHub under JFrog examples under Dynatrace. And so we, we have um, everything is in here that we're going to walk through today. So if you want to see how the sample app itself works, there's a demo app and you can see there's some descriptions of so, it. Uh, Rob, just to interject, are you showing? Something? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yep. I guess I'm not. Um, yeah. So let me, let me go back. So can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. I thought I clicked go. Okay, so right. So here is the code repo I was referring to. So this has, um, let me go back one level. So in the JFrog org, um, there's a Dynatrace example. And that that picture that, that we just had of all these various steps are here. Um, there's a little bit of a readme of kind of the structure of this repo. And I'll be demoing this, but if you want to uh, look at this on your own, and the, and the intention of this is that this can be a quick start guide to try it. So we're waiting for the final publish, but there will be a, a very detailed implementation guide, um, which I'll update on here right now. It's going to end up on the JFrog wiki, but you know this will be updated shortly with the actual page. Um, and the idea is that you guys can do this on your own and try it, try it all out. Um, so let me just jump to and then. So the sample app I was mentioning is this sample app. It's just a single page app. And we'll see as we deploy different versions of it, this the page color will change. That's sort of what it does. Um, but let me just walk into what we're going to see today. So uh, this is the JFrog web UI. And so it's broken into, um, you know, there's a just like similar Dynatrace, there's a left hand menu where you kind of navigate between um, the artifactory artifacts, which we're going to walk talk about, as well as the pipeline. So here we're in the, a pipeline that I set up called Dynatrace Demo. And you can see every time you run the pipeline itself, there's like a unique run number. And what's really kind of cool about this is uh, this is a dynamic chart that as it's analyzing what you programmed into your pipeline, this, this visualization comes up and you can actually click on it and um, you know manually run a particular step or rerun things, but what we're what we're going to be doing is you know I'll run a pipeline in a second, but I just want to walk you through in more detail how it actually works. So similar to that that picture, um, we're going through A B C D E F G. We kind of did it to so it sort, but we're going and you can see here the second column is the 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 step type so that Ali mentioned. So there are a bunch of native types. So Docker build, push, Helm. Bash, these are all native types. And so we, we will configure each of these steps uh, to do the, the appropriate thing we want. So part of setting these things up though, 
And so on the web UI, there's really kind of a more of a, a user mode. And then if you click on the gears, I'm in an administrator mode. So um, if you sign up for a free trial, um, you'll you'll be administrator. That's kind of what we'd recommend. Same with Dynatrace. Um, so the two couple things that we, we set up as sort of prerequisites to running this are um, our repositories. So as, as uh, Elisa mentioned, uh, repositories um, are the heart of of the of, of jfrog and there's a lot of different types so you could um for example i'm just going to show you real quick i'm not going to make one but there are different artifact different repository types um that right. contain different things so the ones we're working with is a helm chart one as well as a docker one um <clears throat> if there's anything you want to add on this while i have it up ali but uh, no no you got it you got it okay. that's good yeah. all right all right, no problem. So, so the ones we've set up for today is, and there's maybe not much to really look at, but I have a uh, a a um, a um, <laughs> can't even speak a Docker repository. So similar, if you've used Docker Hub, you know that it, it uses the Docker utilities. So you, you would log into this private localized uh, repository, and then you can push all your images and they will live inside of here. Same thing with there's a Helm chart package. So there's different ways we can configure it, but basically we're pushing all of our Helm charts, which are a series of YAML files, and they, they kind of get packaged up into like a, zip, a unique zip package, and that's where they live. And then the other piece that we want is our pipelines. So uh, first thing is our pipeline source. So one of the first things you do is I add a and add add a source, and so in this case it's pointing to this um, GitHub repository, which is out, outside of um, of um, our um, JFrog. So we have to provide um, what's called an integration for JFrog to get to this thing. So we have we have the the JFrog pipeline, which is linked to my branch, and so this is how we register that I have a actual pipeline when we run it. So then the integrations come in and there's a couple of them. So, and so we talked about GitHub. Um, yes. We'll just click on that real quick. But the GitHub is, is basically in, uh, the, the API into my GitHub repo. And then the token is my personal access token for the user um, that's managing the ability to, to check out code, check in code, things like that. And that's, that's one integration. Another integration is to Artifactory itself because we are you'll see in a minute we are actually calling the api as well as pushing artifacts into artifactory this is also kind of a built-in type where it will automatically based on my user i can i can change that I'll, I'll get an api key so this this establishes another integration um when i talk about dynatrace so this was defined as um really to store the secrets of it's a little blurry the dynatrace api token and the and the url for dynatrace so that yes. way they're all centralized into one place and then as we use it in the pipeline we just say hey refer to this integration and then i can refer to these as secrets um in a yeah, place. And, and as you can see on rob's screen right here i mean this integration type is a generic integration that you can configure yourself right so in this case what this integration is allowing you to do is to connect uh, this pipeline to your Dynatrace instance using the API token and the URL. And you can define custom variables with, you know, whenever you define a generic integration, you configure it yourself. You have the flexibility to define whatever uh, environment variables you need uh, to make that connection. Whereas, you know, some of the artifactory integrations that were shown before and the GitHub integrations are basically built in native integrations uh, that pipelines or JFrog already right. provides. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 And then the last one, since we're talking to Kubernetes, um, what happens with Kubernetes, won't get into all the details, but you also need a, um, the way you interface with Kubernetes kind of programmatically is something called, uh, one of the utilities is called Kube Control or Kube Cuddle. And part of that, there's a, a Kubernetes configuration file. And so that contains basically the, the permissions to interact um, with, you know, and it can be granular. It can say certain areas and certain roles and certain namespaces. That's also what you define. So this is, these four things are then what the pipeline will reference as it's doing its work. So when I want to, push artifacts in, I use the artifactory one. When I want to interact with Dynatrace, I use the Dynatrace one and so on. So that's key thing. So now that I have my pipeline, I've got my repositories, I've got my integrations. Now I'm, re now I'm re ready to rock and roll here. So if I look at um, now, go, go back to kind of developer mode, look at my, my pipelines, click on my pipeline here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and run it. So let's let's just run it manually here. 
and we'll let this thing go and this hopefully it'll go quickly for us but while while it's um while it's running what i'm going to do is um show a little bit about dynatrace so this 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 will basically this is queuing up so you can see all the steps and then these will trigger and we'll come back and review those real quick but on the dynatrace side just to show you the re the other part of our demo environment I'm using, um, it could be, could have been anything, but we also, Dynatrace works with all the hyperscalers, uh, Azure, uh, Google, uh, AWS, and so we we um, use them all the time. So for in this case, I, I use Google, and I set up a cluster. Um, it's a three-node cluster here, um, and I just went through the UI, and then what we did in Dynatrace was in order for Dynatrace to monitor the cluster, let me come into Dynatrace. So here, here I am in Dynatrace, web UI. So Dynatrace, just similar to JFrog, you can run Dynatrace physically on-prem if you wanted to. You can manage it yourself, it, deploying it out into a cloud provider, for example, or you can run it as SaaS. So in my case, I'm running Dynatrace SaaS. And if you sign up for a free trial, that's basically what you'd get to. You get a dedicated cluster, everything's full featured, and you're in, in Dynatrace. So, the way, so when Dynatrace is monitoring Kubernetes, and I'll show you kind of how we did it, but what we get out of uh, automatically is then a great overview of the cluster. So I'm connecting to a specific cluster. And so I can see the overall utilization and health and resources from an infra standpoint, which are kind of <clears throat> represented here. And I could actually, in this case, there, there's a physical node pool and I could go into each individual node pool and see you know details around that so if my job is more managing the in the kubernetes platform more from an infra standpoint then these are views and, and, and ways that you can analyze the cluster but then typically more a developer um, is is more involved in the is interested in the workloads themselves so in kubernetes these a lot of these are kubernetes uh, terminology um, but pods you can think of kind of the individual kind of deployed um, kind of units of, of that represent your services, and they're deployed out into um, what they call namespaces. So these are kind of logical regions within the cluster. And so in our case, we have a very we have um, one when we would install Dynatrace. There's a there's a Dynatrace um, set of, of, of pods that make up the Dynatrace monitoring itself. So we we it's all based on an operator model. So we when you deploy Dynatrace as a workload into Kubernetes, it's dynamically looking at the nodes, will automatically roll out an agent to roll each of those nodes. And then any any pods that are coming up and down, then it's automatically detecting each of those pods. And we'll see that in a minute, how that actually works. And to, to deploy Dynatrace into Kubernetes, you know, there's, it can be done through an infrastructure as code tool, um, but essentially there's a, series of commands and what we could just show you real quick how I did it was built into Dynatrace um, is a, just a, a kind of a wizard where you can try individual things and get the commands you need to then automate. But for Kubernetes, it's really as simple as, um, um, you know, giving a name for your connection, um, what platform, you know, there's a slight difference for OpenShift versus Kubernetes native. Um, and then we need uh, platform as a service tokens, which is how the agents get deployed as well as an API token. And so when you generate these tokens and I'll just make a, a test one up, then we, we get a command that will um, deploy this out into my environment. And then you'll see that workload and now Dynatrace is monitoring things at that point. And that's really all you need to do. So this is uh, usually a typically one done thing. And then the operator will continuously manage and update the agents uh, as, as, as needed. And then that's where you get the um, Kubernetes dashboard as a result of having that um, in your environment. So that's how Dynatrace uh, is monitoring Kubernetes in a nutshell. Then also with, um, um, let me just maybe expand this just slightly. So today, um, what we're also grabbing, um, we can also interact with um, the, the, the Kubernetes API. And so any sort of native events within Kubernetes, like pods coming up or, or errors, and this can all be configured how you want to filter it. There's like filtering rules or what you want to actually monitor. And the, but then each of these types of events can then further drive alerting actions and things like that. So that's kind of Kubernetes uh, monitoring. Let's go back to our pipeline, kind of see how it's doing. Okay, good. It's chugging along now. So as it's doing this, you can see it's, um, it's um, just progressing through each of these steps. And let's kind of look at the details of each of these and see what it was doing. So as a prepackaged step, there's essentially, it's it's all encapsulated within a within a Docker container. And so it's now, um, you know, th that's what these setup steps are doing. And then when it's actually running, um, what, what, I'm, what it's doing internally is you can actually see um, that I did my, it's, it, it drove my Docker build step itself, you know? And so it's building this step 
and yeah. uh, doing its work. Okay. And so what, where that looks in the pipeline, let me just go back to my pipeline view to show you can see the code. So if you, if in the repo, if you click on pipeline YAML, this is my actual pipeline itself. So what we're at is step number one, doing a Docker build. So you can see I have a built-in type Docker build. And really mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, hey, I want to interact with it, with um, both my GitHub repo where all my code lives. I'm going to interact with Artifactory um, because that's where ultimately I'm going to need to push push my, my artifact. But this is all that's needed. I'm just defining where does my Docker file live? Where what, what image and tag do I want to call it? What are my build options? And that's all I have to do. So then behind the scenes, what Artifactory is, uh, what JFrog Pipelines is doing for that step is performing the Docker build itself. And where that ends up putting it is in my artifact under right. Docker. So I go to my artifact step, my demo app. And then I think I'm on build. What build am I on, Ali? I forget, but I'm on whatever build number I'm on. You right. can see each build gets a unique tag. And so now I have this artifact now inside of my artifact uh, repository here ready to then in a minute be deployed so I built it I pushed it to artifact now it's sitting there for anyone to now consume um, um, here and that's then that's that's the, the artifact store right okay so if I now go back to my pipelines again look at the next step and just for sake of time uh, I think we're good yeah so so what we're what we're doing here is we, we, we then push our repository. The build and the push took place. That's why the push took place. Now what we're doing is um, I'll kind of skip up just a little bit. So when Helm is, is working, there's a Helm chart. And so basically it's customizing the Helm chart properties. I'll kind of come here. So here was my Docker push that we just did. And then now I'm on the Helm publish. So what I want with them in my chart, I need to customize certain properties because I'm saying, hey, in a minute, Kubernetes, I need you to deploy um, this this image, this tag, this app version, and then it's basically building out these two files, a chart and a values file. And then that is dynamically populated with these values. And then when I do my deployment, I'm saying, hey, grab that chart and then deploy that into my environment. And then you can see here, I have the ability to kind of extend this step with my own custom commands where I'm saying, hey, once you deploy it, just for debugging purposes, let me see, um, you know, what are the what are the pods are they running in my Kubernetes um, environment? And so let's look at see how that takes place. So if I come to my Helm deploy step and I look at my um, on success, you can see um, it's running these commands like, you know, after it's done, run the Kubernetes command to say, hey, is my is my um, app running in my environment? And that's that's kind of what's happening here. So what, what happens when you deploy a new version, it, for, it, it will deploy the new one, get it running, and then it terminates the old one. That's just the way Kubernetes deployments work. And you can see here, I, I selected everything that's running in my environment, so I can just kind of debug everything that's happening. Um, so um, next on the list. So we've got, make sure I go back to the pipeline. This is so, actually a really important feature. This is actually a really yep. important feature of the JFrog pipeline uh, platform as well, right? That you can actually click into each and every single each and every each and every individual step and kind of debug them uh, yes. by looking at logs if you know a, a step is taking way too long or a, or a step has failed you can get clear indications of exactly where uh, what inputs have failed or what operators have, have failed for a specific step by looking at the log files clicking into the to the step Exactly right. Yep. And you can also, what I like too, is this gra dynamic graph. You can also click on it. So you can see I did the Helm deploy. And as I click on it, I'm automatically drilling in the details. So this app up check. So just to show you that real quick. So the next in the list is, is my app up? And so this is using a bash script that is first saying, hey, what's the public IP address of my sample app that I just deployed? This is kind of a Kubernetes command. And then it's going to construct the the url to my app and then i'm going to call a script called is my app up script um, and so what that if you want to really see what that looks like in this repo is a scripts folder with some of these helper utilities so if i say app up check what is it basically doing it takes as an input my url and basically loops to make sure the app is actually running and available so that's sort of a way to check could I reach the app? And then if not, it will exit out and then that'll, that'll stop the pipeline. So, um, 
If we go back to the pipeline, we can see as it executes it, you can kind of look at the output of each of these commands. Um, actually, the, the final output is, you know, running this thing, and you can see this is the output of the script waiting for such and such of app to be ready, and boom, it's ready. And if I click mm -hmm. on that, I get the hyperlink actually to the app, which is kind of cool too. Um, right, cool. So then the next, I don't know if there's anything that on that one, but the next the next step is um, now we want to do um, this is kind of Ali jump in on this one too. So what we're doing here is we've got some dynamic values. Let me go back to the pipeline code. Uh, go back to the pipeline script, and we scroll down to the modify helm we called it modify helm chart properties so right. what we're doing here is we're interacting with um artifactory again we're also looking at some of the objects that are in the repository one we need github because we're gonna we're gonna need to run that a, a different script but then the helm chart we can interrogate um the properties of that helm chart um through an api call so here what we've done just to make it easier to read the code you know we get the we get and you can see here this is actually all these built-in variables, like when I make an artifactory integration, I ha these anything that's an integration was prefaced with int, and then the property is an is a, is a suffix. So I could say get the, the URL and API key because I've defined that I want to interact with it. That's how you work with that. I kind of made my own names, and then I pass them into this other script, which is modifying um, the properties. And I'll show you how that's done. So if I look at here. Yeah, so the, properties yeah, just to, just just to explain, yeah. yeah, just to explain what's going on here is that, you know, we in, in a previous step, we actually associated this Helm chart with the application that we're going to be eventually deploying in, in, in a Kubernetes cluster. So now that we've actually deployed in the previous step, uh, this Helm chart into the Kubernetes cluster, what we're trying to do now is to use the artifactory integration to enrich the Helm chart with some environment variables or cluster related properties so that we can have some traceability on exactly what environment uh, this particular application has been deployed. Now here, if you scroll down, I think, uh, Rob, go ahead, go ahead. With, uh, with oh yeah, this. no, so yeah. So what this, that's why we wrote it as a script. So you can see what it's doing. We put some, put some comments in here. We, mm -hmm. we want to add a property called, where did I deploy this thing? And also just kind of what was the timestamp right. for demo purposes. So this could be anything you want it to be. But what, what it's doing here is constructing here, um, you know, the URL endpoint. So you can see there's the base URL to JFrog API storage, and then the endpoint is the chart that we're interested in updating. And then here we can do basically, a, I think it's a, a just a, a put request. You can see here it's a put request to then put these properties into it. So here just through a simple curl, we're invoking the, the API. And of course we need our, our token to do such a thing. But if let's look at what that did. So what, it, what it's doing on that step is in Artifactory for our packages, uh, I'm sorry, in our artifacts for our chart that we just added. Let me expand yeah. our chart. So this mm -hmm. chart was pushed, remember earlier, we dynamically made the chart and what two things happened. As I mentioned, if you remember, I mentioned a chart YAML as well as a values YAML. So what was happening is we wanted to deploy this version of the application. And then also we have a values file, which was also dy dynamically updating a few things like the image tag, um the the also the image value um as well and so these two things combined with the template so wait helm works is a little sidebar on kubernetes is um with you you have these configuration files that describe the deployment that you want to make into kubernetes so kubernetes is definitely a, a, a deep topic <laughs> but just to show you there's different types of objects a deployment thing are things like i want to deploy um Ultimately, this image at the end of the day, it's like I'm deploying this image um, and I'm going to expose that image on a particular port and I can add these different metadata labels. And then in conjunction with that, there's a service object that is now how I'm exposing, in this case, as a load balancer, I'm saying this, this Kubernetes service um, is exposing itself with a public IP address on port 80 and mapping it to the port 80 of the running deployment kind of I know a big mouthful there but essentially this is how you deploy and can configure a service to be publicly accessible so when we look at the app this this is the load balancer IP that was made as part of that deployment so but, but going to the properties which is the whole point of this if we go back to the actual um, 
top level properties of the chart. If we look in the properties now, uh, if everything went right, da, 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 there we go. Yay. Yeah. So these two properties deployed on cluster and deployment timestamp were our custom properties that we pushed into the artifact as part of the pipeline. So you can see here, this, this value is the name of my cluster where I deployed this thing. So now we've informed, you know, the, ver you know, this is full auditability, right? So we know what right. version um, we, we could do, we could put, you could put other types of things in here too, but you know, this is just for demo to show you the technique yeah. of, 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 of that. Anything else yeah. you want to add Ali? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So moving on. So the next one, um, in our pipeline, so we're, this is the, the whirlwind tour of the pipeline is our, um, our next step is our, um, configure Dynatrace step. So this is uh, just for sake of time, I'm going to kind of go quickly. And then if we have time, I'll kind of come back and explain it a little bit more, but essentially, um, the configuration for, um, the Dynatrace config that I'm interested in is, is stored in individual little files here in this directory called Monaco. So Mon there's a there, there's a readme where I explained this with more details about how to learn more about it. But essentially what it consists of is a, a, a defined structure of different configuration types. So if I want a um, service level objective, for example, I have a configuration file that says, hey, I have a config that's, that's all stored. You know, so you can have one to many of these things. So this one just has one. But I have a config called, you know, demo app error rate, and the the definition of it is stored inside of this JSON file. So this config is tied to the Dynatrace um, API call. So when you, if you were to go into Dynatrace and say programmatically add a um, service level objective, which is what this is, um, this definition of my service level objective can be added and updated via the Dynatrace API. And so what this config set of config files is doing is storing them in the code so then when the pipeline runs it's essentially um and I'll, I'll pull up the pipeline step you can see it pipelines so if i go to the configure dynatrace step look in the details of it what it's doing is um, what we've done is wrappered the the Monaco tool in another Docker container. So this is again, and it's open source, so you can see all the links are there, but what it's doing is now invoking the, the configuration execution. And you can see it's kind of processing all the files in the directory that are in my code repo and performing all of those config changes. And then it's done without error. So this is how you would then define all your config, run this step, and then all the Dynatrace config, um, as much as you wanted, would be then updated within, within Dynatrace. So then the last piece that I want to show is, um, and this is what Ali has been waiting for anxiously, <laughs> is our, is our, is our, 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 what we call the deployment event itself. So if we go into yeah. the last, the very last one here is our post Dynatrace event. So Dynatrace, and I'll show it, but this is how it gets invoked. Um, there's a series of parameters where we're informing Dynatrace of all this great metadata around the around this particular execution. So we need the URL and token to Dynatrace and we get that through that integration that we showed earlier. That's how we get the URL. Then we have a series of properties like what project was this for? What was my build? What's my hyperlink back to the JFrog pipeline? So you can see there's a, um, this is actually a built, one of the built-in variables um, for, for JFrog pipelines, there's tons of them, but that's one of them. Um, then I can I can dynamically build my my tag and image name and so forth. You can see all this data, and then I'm basically um, way many things that Dynatrace work are are through matching of tags. So what this is doing is matching a a tag for the service, um, which you can see. Um, um, these are actually other variables, but the, there's, the, there's the service, the project, and the stage tags. And then when we, we push the deployment event itself, I'll just show you the script. It's a push. And again, this is all code that you could reuse, take. And so this will be a lot of output, but essentially it's building up a, a API call payload. This is the payload that the Dynatrace API expects. And then it just doing another curl request as a post message to p post that in and boom, and then these are the tag rules that it matches. And so in Dynatrace, let's let's look at it now. So if we look at our um, release inventory page of Dynatrace, so this is where I, sh I had a, a screenshot, um, but when in my environment, I said this one app, but you can see here, I've got a series of deployments that took place in my environment through my testing. Um, so the one that we just did today is, let me just kind of 
move these out of the way a little bit. You can see it a little better. Let's look at this a little more closely. So what, what we've told Dynatrace now is um, um, this, this pipeline job, and you can see this is what the, one of the cool that, that got substituted. And if I click on that, I go back to the specific job um, that did the deployment. So when Ali was talking about different teams, you know, not knowing what happened in the environment, this is what we were talking about. So you now know a, a deployment event took place. It affected this particular component. This is the specific job that did it. <laughs> so you know exactly who did it, when they did it. And then here's a bunch of other data that could be extended um, to let you know more details around it. So this could be other URLs back into the Artifactory, but this is telling you a lot of the, the image names that was deployed um, where where this was taking place, what what run number, what project it was related to, and so this this data, and we'll see we'll see if we have, um, um, can also inform the AI engine of Dynatrace. So if there's anomalies in the environment, it's not saying that this is the root cause per se, but if it was taking place in the window of time when a problem was detected, it can right. associate the events for the imp, for the root cause service. And it's usually a pretty good clue. So if it's like the problem started 30 seconds after you did a deployment, chances are it's that. And so right. one one cool, you know, more advanced technique is when you, um, if that did take place, Dynatrace through a webhook could call, say, the JFrog pipeline and say, roll that thing back. You know, so there's so there's, there's a lot more advanced use cases now that you have the data. So the key is getting the data. So now that yeah. you've told Dynatrace, this is my service, I can dynamically detect that it's there. I can see the events that are taking place. I can see the changes and config changes that are taking place. Um, now I can really inform a lot of the automation um, to take advantage of all this metadata. And even, even extend this data uh, for troubleshooting purposes or remediation pur purposes for other stakeholders like SREs who would actually want access to, to all of this data uh, to build the context around a problem and to go out, go out and resolve it. Uh, you know, through, right. through, the, through the usage of maybe perhaps an ITSM tool like PagerDuty or something else, ServiceNow, for example, uh, exactly that you already right. have built in integrations with in Dynatrace. Right, exactly right. So what happens in Dynatrace when you go to um, problem notifications, one of the, one of the out of the box things I'll just show real quick is, um, you know, there's, um, there's um, a way to, uh, well, you know, I don't know if I have an example here, but there's a way to d define alerting, alerting profile. So you could focus certain type of alerts, again, also driven by um, tagging rules and another concept in Dynatrace called management zones. There's ways to filter um, that based on the types of events, the severity type, and build a collection of different alerting profiles. So then when you have a problem that comes up and you want to push it down to a some downstream system, um, you can then um, do something from, you know, anywhere from email to Ops Genie to PagerDuty to, um, you know, Ansible Tower, or just a custom webhook. So this could call, like if you have the endpoint, um, and you have the credentials, this can be pushed to anything. So this could drive another JFrog pipeline tool, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And then all the payload, all this metadata um, can be is passed along with that. So then that downstream tool has all this information that it can, can interact with to help prioritize route accordingly. And so the more, so it's kind of like the more you, the more you enrich the metadata, the more that it kind of passes through the systems and can really drive um, some sophisticated use cases. Great. So, um, Rob, does that conclude your demo? Or yeah, I think yeah, time went by really fast. So I'm gonna, uh, I, 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 you know, we could talk all day. So uh, hopefully, we gave you a good taste, and um, yeah, we'll move on to the end. So yeah, I guess we're at the top of the hour. So back to you. Yeah, and uh, you know, I apologize, but this is so interesting and it has so many applications there, and so much, so much that we can do beyond this once we have this now configured. That is just. Uh, you know, it's kind of taken away all the time, but we're open to questions. Uh, but before we get there, I, I think, uh, you know, just a call out, if you wanted to try out these two platforms, uh, you know, you can you can use this QR code to start a free trial for JFrog, as well as the QR code to start, get started with Dynatrace as well. And that'll all be published. Anyway, so let's go back to questions, if we have any. Yeah, so please, yeah, anyone that's on the line, if you want to um, post a post a chat uh, question, uh, let's and um, yeah, if anyone want, if you want to moderate any of those for us, um, yeah. So here's one: um, Is Dynatrace 
limited to monitoring Kubernetes. I'll take the first one. Um, no, absolutely not. Um, so as you saw, Dynatrace is a um, is a full platform, being able to monitor things at a at a host level. So if it's a host, it could be any sort of .NET job application, for example, running on that particular host. Um, obviously, Kubernetes and containers is a special category. So if it's Docker, Docker Compose, Kubernetes, anything with AWS, for example, App Runner, um, Fargate, all those are fully covered. Um, as well as native applications, there's ways to compile an SDKs into native mobile apps, for example. Um, so there's a full range of monitoring. And then again, monitoring is not limited to app monitoring. There's a lot of metric ingestion, log ingestion that can also trigger, um, you know, problem identification as well. Okay, so the next one is about integrations generally with Artifactory and GeoFrog pipelines. So I mentioned this during the talk as well. There's a series of different integrations that GeoFrog, uh, both Artifactory and pipelines host. In pipelines in particular, you've got uh, uh, you know built-in integrations with uh, with uh, your version control systems like uh, Bitbucket, like GitHub. You saw some of that in action today. Um, integrations, built-in integrations with Artifactory, built-in integrations with X-Ray for scanning purposes, um, built-in integrations with uh, your CI tools, uh, whether it be Jenkins or Circle CI or others. Um, there are also built-in integrations with, um, uh, you know, uh, platforms like Jira, uh, where, where you can actually get information from your pipeline runs um you know directly within jira there's integrations across the board with itsm tools uh like pager duty for example that we recently launched where you can collect data on the bills uh build runs from your pipeline so you know how long did, did the run take the version of the run build number and so on all this metadata uh is reflected and and um, extended to uh, you know, stakeholders uh, that use um, PagerDuty as an ITSM change management kind of a tool. Um, there's also um, integrations with um, uh, configuration management tools, um, like I mentioned during the talk, where you know there's teams who who would uh, be responsible for provisioning uh, and configuration management changes uh, for the infrastructure that um, is associated with running some of these uh, build and deploy uh, jobs um, so integrations with ansible terraform chef puppet uh, those are already existing and then you know there's a series of generic integrations that we talked about during the course of this webinar where you can actually configure um, integrations with third party tools uh, through the usage of um, uh, you know uh, API tokens or whatnot um, that you saw, for example, with Dynatrace. Um, the setting up of Dynatrace with the JFrog pipelines that was uh, that utilized that generic integration. Um, there's another one about when you run pipelines, does it collect metadata? So this actually was showcased during the demo as well towards the end, where Rob showed all the metadata that we've collected and, and um, sent over into the Dynatrace engine using the Dynatrace API. And there's a lot of metadata that JFrog as a platform actually collects, not just pipelines. Pipelines, you know, it collects data from your build, um, test, deploy, um, staging, uh, you know, your CD pipelines. It collects data or metadata on um, the composition of the build, uh, which is encapsulated in something we call build information or build info, um, uh, you know, which is basically a canonical record of what actually gets encapsulated in a composed artifact or an image. Um, there's a concept of, uh, you know, a metadata collection uh, around, um, uh, around components, around uh, dependencies, uh, metadata collection around uh, violations through X-ray. So there's a lot of different metadata um, uh, collection that is happening uh, across the entire DevOps lifecycle. And um, we've also made sure that we not only 
send this metadata into plat into uh, you know the cloud automation kind of platforms with Dynatrace, but also the observability pieces with respect to observing the um, uh, the JFrog platform, right? So we've got integrations on on that front as well. Okay, uh, right. thank yeah. you, Ali. I see I see one more question in the Q and A box, but unfortunately, we're also um, running out of time as we went over the hour. So we'll make sure to follow up uh, with the questions we didn't answer via email. Um, Ali, Rob, anything else to add in the end? Yeah, well, yeah, well, thank you, everyone. And yeah, hopefully you got a good taste. And um, yeah, definitely reach out to us. And um, we're happy to answer more and, and answer questions. But it's really easy to uh, get started. Um, so thank you again, Jay Frog, for the uh, opportunity to showcase Dynatrace. Thanks, thanks, Rob, and thanks uh, the Dynatrace team. And this is a very exciting uh, piece that we built together. And uh, hopefully, you know, with more revisions on it, I think we can we can expand uh, on the use case that we just described. Even Absolutely, more. yeah. So definitely, so book bookmark the uh, repo, and um, we will have the uh, getting started guide, which really walks through how you could do everything yourself. So welcome to your welcome to feedback. We did co use Kubernetes as our example, but it's certainly not limited to that. But um, so yeah. if you want help. Um, trying it on your one of your own apps. Um, we're we're that's what we're here for. Great, thank you everyone once again for joining us. Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, you will receive the recording of the of the webinar tomorrow. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, and uh, we wish you a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.